think most of my childhood, from what I can remember, was actually really quite pleasant. I found out um, a little bit later on, when I was 15 or 16, um, the reason why I've got such a bad memory from when I was very young. There were four of us, um, three brothers, an elder brother and two younger brothers. But as I say, when I was about 15 or 16, I found that my elder brother and I were from a different marriage um, and that the two younger brothers were actually from the, the second marriage that my father had, but we'd all been brought up together. So I discovered at 16 that the person that I thought was my mother actually wasn't my mother, she was only a stepmom. Because my dad was always a heavy drinker and then over the years my mum kind of joined in and then so as my teenage years went on it feels like it got darker and darker. Um, the, they rowed a lot and that was very much tied in with them getting drunk and there'd be like a pattern. They'd start drinking maybe about seven o'clock and as the evening wore on it kind of had a shape and I'd be very aware of that. And so you'd start to have this dread of when the peak of this, you know, peak of this wave would come. Um, and I'd felt that most of what I could remember from my childhood had been a lie, if you like. It wasn't because it was all real experiences, but it was really shocking to find out that every single person that I'd ever met in my life knew something about me that I didn't. Every other person knew that this lady wasn't my mum, but I didn't know and I hadn't been told. One of the photographs, my dad's playing the bagpipes and he was very musical. He also used to play the guitar, um, but, it, but bagpiping in particular, he was very, very good at it and he was regarded as very good. There was one time, not, I, I don't remember this because I was too young, I think, um, but he actually played in the Edinburgh Tattoo and he would be sent people to teach the bagpipes because he was regarded as like the best piper that they'd ever had before or since. I was 16 or 17 when um, the relationship with my father and his second wife really started to, to disintegrate. Um, and it just, it really just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. Um, my dad just retreated into himself and had a bit of a nervous breakdown um, and he had his own issues to deal with and eventually what she did was she actually left home she um, she just went to the shops one morning while the kids were watching swap shop or whatever it was and just never came home um, which led to my dad's further breakdown <laughs> which meant that I was actually the, the eldest at home because my elder brother had left I was actually the eldest at, at the time and I ended up having to look after these two young'uns. I kind of guess the age of about 15. I can remember getting more involved in my mum and dad's situation and kind of becoming what feels very much like a mediator. And I can actually remember sitting, because the way our living room was set up, you had my dad's chair on one side of the fireplace and my mum's chair on the other side of the fireplace and a sofa in between. And I can remember sitting on the sofa and they'd be like talking, but my dad would like misconstrue what my mum, he'd like take offence at something and he wouldn't listen to her saying I didn't mean it that way. So I'd end up kind of going, what she actually meant was, and I'd be trying to smooth the waters really, trying to smooth things down. Uh, but it feels like that happened quite a lot. Uh, left home at 17 and went to, I mean obviously it was abrupt because I hadn't spoken to her saying I'm thinking of leaving home, would it be okay if I come to live with you? Um, and obviously she had the room and she was quite happy to say yes, so I just went to live with my natural mother. Um, Unfortunately, I was only there, I would say, a matter of weeks, possibly two months, and uh, we weren't really getting on that well. Um, it wasn't horrible, it was just really quite strange because you were living with this person who you know is your mother, but you know absolutely nothing about her really. And I felt quite um, 
quite isolated because it was miles and miles away from school. So any friends that I did actually keep in occasional contact with were miles away. So when I went off to university, which is 1977, so that was a big step then. It was physically um, a long way away. We didn't have a phone at home, but my mum used to write me letters sometimes, and I think I, I did write back actually. Um, maybe like two or three times a term, and they'd just be nice little letters, little chatty bits of news. Um, certainly nothing about any of the like troubled situations at home. Um, and then, as I say, a matter of maybe two months, and my mother sat me down and just said, I think you ought to know that, um, that the marriage is broken down and we're getting a divorce. Um, and I was in this situation where I'd just come from a horrendous home situation where the marriage had broken down and was just all these emotions flying everywhere to living with a woman that I actually barely knew who was in a situation where her marriage was breaking down by, I don't know, July maybe, so I'd been there about five months. Um, she decided that she was moving out and she, she was looking for a house away from where, where she was living with, with this guy. So we, we looked at a couple of houses and I just assumed that, you know, I was going with her. And uh, I'm laughing because it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time, but I actually came home and every stick of furniture was piled up in like, because they had this huge hallway. And I was like, oh, oh, we're moving then. Um, and then um, mother came out of the kitchen, accused me of sleeping with her husband, said she didn't want anything to do with me. And will you tell him? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay <laughs> and she just moved out so I was left with this um, guy that I'd known for six months maybe um, out in the middle of nowhere boyfriend was away none of my previous family was speaking to me at all and um, and we had uh, a bed each that was it it felt like during that certainly the late teens up to me leaving to go to university I think it did feel like things were building up to a head um, and that something terrible could happen. But even then, I, it, I, I feel fairly confident that it never crossed my mind that that's what he would do, that he would take his own life. Some people will never think about suicide, and others will. My experience, I think, has shown me that to think about suicide is to be human, that this is part of being alive for many of us, many people. We know that about as many as one in 20 people think about killing themselves in a year, so that's 5% of us. So that was the point where I just thought, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, it's too hard. There's nobody around that gives the monkeys about how I feel anyway. And I think that was probably the most isolated I felt in my entire life. And I remember um, being quite methodical about the whole thing and searching around the entire house for every single tablet that I could find because I was, I was too chicken to slip my wrists and do it properly. Because looking back on it, it was more a cry for help than anything else. But I found every single pill that I could find in that. It didn't matter what they were, I didn't care. And I, I actually remember lining them all up on the carpet and there just being like this many <laughs> on the carpet and just taking them all. Um, and just going to bed and thinking, well, that's it, you know, painless enough, that's it. Now I don't have to deal with anything else anymore. And then I woke up the next morning and I was absolutely devastated that I was still here. I don't think I ever actually thought he would commit suicide or that he, he was thinking in that way. I, I think I did have a big fear that something cataclysmic would happen, but I think if you'd have asked me at that time to guess what that might be, I think I'd have thought that he would hurt my mum and not that he would hurt himself. There are two very big issues I think 
that people experiencing thoughts of suicide are dealing with. And one is whatever it is that's led that person to come to a point in their life where they felt unable to carry on living, where they felt they can't bear to carry on staying alive. And people's reasons for dying vary hugely, but research has shown us, and my experience has borne this out, that very often experiences of loss are central to why someone has come to feel unable to stay alive and often stressful events as well, stressful life events. So basically, um, I was living in this hall of residence and the, one of the porters knocked on the door and it was like quarter past, half past six in the morning and said, there's a phone call for you. So that was very strange. And I knew then that something had happened in my family. Um, so I went downstairs and had to go behind the porter's desk to take this phone call. Um, and it was my old brother. So basically, my brother was saying, you need to come home today. Um, and that my dad had died. But he didn't tell me how. And when I tried to kind of say what had happened, he just said, there's been an accident and I'll tell you, I will, you know, I'll tell you when you come home. Um, so I went back upstairs and I can remember opening the door of this room and just saying to my boyfriend, my dad's dead. Which I think he'd kind of guessed anyway, or, he, or that somebody had. We know that one of the risk factors for someone attempting or completing suicide is that a person feels alone. Again, that's research-based, but it's also very much borne out from my experience with people thinking about suicide. So we both basically got a train up to Liverpool. So that's like a five-hour journey. And even then, we spent a lot of that journey with me saying what could have happened and suicide wasn't one of the options. And then when we got to Liverpool, my boyfriend went off to his house and I was walking down our road and got to our house and my brother, came, my brother must have been watching out for me arriving and he came out of the house, down the path and met me um, and that's when he told me how my father had died, that he'd committed suicide. Um, so I only just had time, I was kind of hit with that news just before going in the house. Um, and then went in the house and there were lots of other family there. There were my mum's sisters and other people, I can't really remember, but I remember there being quite a lot of people there and my mum sitting on the sofa, and even though she's amongst people, somehow looking alone. And um, I just went straight over to her, and we hugged each other, and I cried and she cried. Um, and then my auntie saying, that's really good, because she hadn't been able to cry before. It was me getting there that allowed her to cry. Some people may experience just one time in their lives when they think about suicide or attempt suicide, but for other people those thoughts will recur throughout their life and that can be really painful, really difficult, not just for the person thinking about suicide but also for people in their life who love them and care about them. This is where I'm a little bit having a problem because I still feel the same way quite often. Sorry. So in some ways I feel a bit of a fraud, but I'm still here. Oh, flip. It's trying to have that positivity to, to show to people. Because it hasn't all, all been bad. Sorry. 
but I still haven't found. Oh dear me, still haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, There have been times that have been absolutely fantastic. But there have also been times that have been really, really crap. <laughs> oh, flipping heck. But the way I get through that is just, I've been at the point where I don't want to live anymore. And I can get really low but I suppose I'm I don't know how you can relate being an optimist with, with somebody that doesn't want to live anymore but there's always that little spark of hope that things will get better and they invariably do it doesn't mean that they get the way that I want them to be but they do get better sorry 